Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer incentive set of offers. 15,178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xE and Summit 4xE models and dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark. Hi, I'm Scott Chesworth and welcome to the ancient world. Episode 29, A More Perfect Empire. When the Romans of the later Republic reflected on their kings, they considered their unique character, their piety or belligerence, and the traditions, institutions, and infrastructure they'd contributed to the city. But above all, the kings of Rome were measured by how effectively they'd paved the way for the coming Republic. By this standard, only one king would merit the title second founder of Rome, Servius Tullius. Tullius's popular 43-year reign, the longest of any Roman king, touched every aspect of Roman society. The Rome of seven hills, fortified by pickets, ramparts, trenches, moats, and walls, was his creation. The king even made his home on the newly incorporated Esquiline Hill to increase its popularity among his subjects. The Temple of Diana, supposedly modeled on the Artemisian of Ephesus, was also raised by Tullius. The fact that the temple served all Latins but was sited in Rome reflects the city's role as de facto regional capital. In terms of darker institutions lurk the Tullianum, an underground cell at the base of the Capitoline Hill where the enemies of Rome were executed by strangulation. Tullius's greatest reforms concerned what it meant to be a Roman, and what benefits and obligations that title conferred. To start things off, the king ordered all citizens to assemble in the campus Martius, the Field of Mars, and register their tribe, age, social rank, household, property, and income with the city. Each social rank was subdivided into groups of roughly a hundred citizens, or centurii. Then each group was divided further by age. This event, the first Roman census, established each individual's tax obligations on a tribal basis, hence the term tribute, his requirements for military service, including the weapons and armor he was required to supply, and his place within a tribal voting bloc. This first census confirmed 80,000 Romans capable of bearing arms, a number that would grow enormously during the later Republic and Empire. Once Tullius had a handle on his population, he abolished the old Comitia Curiata, an obsolete body dominated by three patrician tribes of Roman founders, and established in its place a larger citizen assembly known as the Centuria Curiata. Where previously voting rights had been restricted to certain groups, based on ancestry, status, or ethnicity, residence in Rome was now the sole requirement. However, as a nod to the traditional aristocracy, while all centuries could vote, the wealthiest were allowed to vote first, and their votes were still weighted such that they often carried the day. Despite this structure, Tullius's reforms were considered extremely populist in nature, greatly expanding voting rights and generally improving the lot of Rome's poorer citizens. Despite his popularity, the cracks in the foundations of Tullius's rule had never been adequately addressed. In short, he was a former slave, his predecessor had been violently murdered, and he'd become king through deceit and without a vote of the people. Most ominously, the sons of his predecessor remained alive and in Rome. Roman heirs really were masters of the slow burn. Lucius Tarquinius, the former king's more ambitious son, maneuvered for decades to create the optimal environment to make his play for the throne. First, there was the minor inconvenience that he was married to the loyal daughter of Servius Tullius, 
Tully the Elder, while his unambitious brother Aaron's Tarquinius was married to the far more opportunistic Tully the Younger. The bad seeds of both lines connived in private and ginned up the awesome plan of, well, killing each other's spouses, i.e. their own brother and sister, so they'd be free to marry their scheming and malicious soulmates. It really is a fairy tale love story. Evil mission accomplished and super dubious remarriage arranged, young TNT moved quickly to phase two. In 535 BC, Tarquin went to the house of the Roman Senate, still an elite, patrician-dominated advisory body to the king. As a clear sign that something was up, Tarquin was dressed in the full regalia of Roman kingship and had a group of armed men in tow. Pulling out his note cards and passing around a brisk PowerPoint presentation, he hit all the main bullet points. Tullius was a slave, born of a slave— Tullius had never been elected, Tullius had been gifted the throne by a woman, the former king's wife, Tanaquil, and, last but not least, Tullius was a class warrior who wanted to give all the money, property, and power of the rich away to the poor. By the time he put up the last slide, the one asking for questions, he and his armed guards had already made a pretty strong impact on the room. When Servius Tullius finally showed up, the crowd was pretty agitated, and Tarquin was positively on fire. Tullius barely had the chance to speak before he was thrown down the steps of the Senate House by Tarquin, murdered in the street by Tarquin's men, and, in a final super-classy touch, run over by Tullia the Younger in her chariot. Those two crazy kids, they were just meant to be together. Tarquin's first official act was to deny his father-in-law proper burial as a Roman king, an act for which the later Roman historian Livy denounced him as Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud. The fact that Tarquin had no greater claim to the throne than Tullius was lost on absolutely no one. After all, Rome still had no tradition of hereditary kingship. Ruling at the same time as Pisistratus in Athens, Tarquin was essentially the Roman version of a Greek tyrant. Though he began his reign in a similar mode, neutralizing his enemies and securing his power base, his tactics were less restrained than those of his Greek contemporary. As his primary tool, Tarquin claimed the power to bring and rule on capital cases without the advice or consent of the Senate. This allowed him to eliminate powerful enemies as well as claim their money and land. His refusal to replace Senate members he condemned to death meant that both the size and power of the body shrank accordingly. While eliminating rivals at home, Tarquin also worked to strengthen alliances abroad. Convening a meeting of Latin towns at a grove sacred to the goddess Ferentina, Tarquin called on those assembled to both renew their alliances with Rome and formalize his city's position of leadership. After framing and killing a rival who spoke out against him, by planting weapons at the man's house, accusing him of plotting a coup, then having him stoned and drowned, Tarquin accomplished his aim. The other Latin cities pledged to support the Roman military machine, with each contributing one Latin unit to match each Roman unit, essentially doubling the number of men under Tarquin's command. Under Tullius, the Roman army had been organized into centurii, or centuries, determined by the census. Emulating the Greek example, the Romans used typical hoplite weapons and armor and fought in the massed phalanx formation, with each battle line composed of members of a single Roman class. Tarquin would soon test his new army against that great Roman enemy, the Volsci. The conflict would eventually span decades and serve as proving ground for that later tragic Republican military figure, Gaius Martius Coriolanus. Even as Rome continued its slow climb to regional prominence, civilizations that had dominated the Near East for thousands of years were passing into history and legend. Elam had fallen to Assyria, then Assyria to Media, and hardly a trace of either great power remained. 
Babylonia, still strong and culturally prominent, and spared the ravages of an all-out war with the Persians, would succumb to a different fate. Virtually from its foundation, the city had served as a major locus of Near Eastern power, either as an imperial capital or, at the very least, a sacred city whose special place in the universe must always be acknowledged. Although it would remain a cultural mecca for centuries, the arrival of the Persians signaled the end of Babylon's central role in the politics of the Near East. Important figures, first the Gutian general Gabrius, then Cyrus's own son Cambyses II, would be appointed to rule over Babylonia. But the Persian Empire would instead be governed from Cyrus's new capital of Pasargadae, far away in former Elamite lands south of the Zagros. Construction of the new capital had begun in 546 BC, soon after the conquest of Lydia, and would continue over the remainder of Cyrus's reign. Surrounded, as might be expected, by high defensive walls, Pasargadae featured a fortified citadel, several palaces, and a number of other monumental buildings. It also included a cult area for the worship of the Persian god Ahura Mazda, on whom more later. The many open spaces of the city were filled with expansive, luxurious gardens. The old Persian word for such features, paradaisa, passed through the Greek paradaisos to give us the English word paradise. The Persians were extremely fond of such gardens, and planted them in all the major cities throughout their empire. While his skill as a conqueror was already legendary, Cyrus would show equal ability in the political management of his new realm. What was his secret? Well, where Neo-Assyria had reduced all conquered people to Assyrians, and Neo-Babylonia had considered only southern Mesopotamia worthy of its attention, Cyrus, and I'm sorry if this sounds a little new agey, believed that all subject peoples were worthy of respect and all had something useful to contribute to the overall greatness of the Persian Empire. Wherever there were prior lessons to be learned, superior technologies to borrow, or existing infrastructure to co-opt, the Persians were more than happy to oblige. This was reflected in their expansion of the Neo-Assyrian royal road system, the adoption of local tax collection and administrative schemes, even in the use of local languages. Having never bothered to develop a written language of their own, a situation later remedied during the reign of Darius I, the Persians were happy to continue using the Elamite script in Persia, Akkadian cuneiform in Babylonia, etc., and Persian royal inscriptions were almost always multilingual. For the main administrative language of the empire, the Persians chose Aramaic, due to both its widespread popularity and ease of use. In continuity with other empires, particularly Neo-Assyria, the Persians ruled over their territories either through vassal kings or directly via Persian governors. Provincial rulers were called satraps, from the old Persian Saka Pavan, or protector of the province. The satraps' primary responsibility was the collection of tribute, in the form of gold, silver, and other resources unique to the area, and its annual shipment back to the Persian capital. The satrap was also responsible for keeping the peace, supervising local officials, facilitating military recruitment, dispensing justice, keeping administrative records, and, in general, enforcing the great king's will. The power of ambitious satraps was nullified through two complementary arrangements. First, both the treasurer and chief military officer of each satrapy reported directly to the Persian king. And second, the empire was constantly crisscrossed by a number of roving administrators known as the Eyes of the King, who were tasked with ensuring both satrap loyalty and general good governance. Cyrus also founded an elite 10,000-strong Persian military unit known as the Immortals. Composed of heavy infantry and used as both imperial bodyguard and standing army, their name derived from the fact that every slain member would be immediately replaced to keep their numbers constant. 
Having taken part in the capture of Babylon, the immortals would also feature prominently in Persian conflicts in Egypt, India, Scythia, and against Greek forces at Thermopylae. But still, a few novel institutions and a willingness to copy from those with more experience do not a great empire make. Cyrus's one true genius concept, the one that had never really been tried before, can be summed up in three words. Zero cultural imperialism. And that's not to take anything away from Cyrus or the Persians by implying that they had no real culture to export. They did. They were Aryans, the heirs of ancient nomadic steppe tribes, with traditions, values, and beliefs stretching back for centuries. But however much they may have honored, treasured, or lived by them personally, the Persians never made any attempt to impose their traditions, values, or beliefs on any of their subject peoples. In contrast, wherever they went, Persian kings claimed to be upholding local traditions, neglected or abused by those in power. In victory, they adopted native titles, fulfilled customary obligations, and gave every outward appearance of cultural understanding and respect. Whether real or contrived, or a mixture of both, the approach met with near-universal success, in both granting Persian rule added legitimacy and minimizing the resentment of subject peoples. In a similar vein, the Persians also practiced universal religious tolerance, patronizing and protecting local cults, and frequently associating their actions with divine inspiration. Cyrus had cast himself as Marduk's agent during the capture of Babylon, and was also trumpeted by the Judeans as chosen of the god Yahweh to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. Again, whether he believed it or not, it was all very good press. This innovative policy, coupled with his own personal charisma and military skill, enabled Cyrus to assume control over a vast empire made up of dozens of subject peoples over an incredibly short time span. Granted, in the Near East, the process was facilitated by long centuries of imperial rule, which had served to weaken local identities and accustom people to domination by foreign powers. But, most tellingly, where the Neo-Assyrians had been despised, the Persians, and especially Cyrus, were loved, or at least not hated anywhere near as much. On the other hand, despite their radically different approaches, the Persian Empire suffered from the same critical flaw that had doomed Neo-Assyria. It was held together almost exclusively by the exceptional qualities of its great king. Not much is known about the actions of Cyrus during the decade following his capture of Babylon. You can probably make the standard assumptions, administration, consolidation, and ongoing warfare, but useful details are lacking. The Persians were not the Neo-Assyrians, inscribing every major campaign in high detail and low relief on the walls of their palaces. Even more of a factor was that it was Cyrus's eastern territories that appeared to demand the bulk of his attention. Where the Persian Empire interfaced with the highly literate Hebrews and Greeks of the West, their activities were often documented, sometimes by multiple sources and in minute detail. But the East remained the home of illiterate tribal nomads, where even the most epic of battles or most notable of achievements could only be carried down through the less reliable medium of oral tradition. What is known is that in 530 BC, while campaigning beyond the distant Jaxartes River in the land of the Masagatai, Cyrus the Great met his end in battle. Several versions of his death are recorded. One, by Herodotus, credits a Masagatai queen and war leader named Tomyris with killing and decapitating the great king. According to legend, she then plunged his head into a wineskin filled with blood, in order, she claimed, to finally slake Cyrus's insatiable thirst for conquest. Regardless of the gruesome details, his body was recovered by his soldiers and returned to the Persian capital for burial. His tomb still stands today, in the ruins of Basarjadai, and once bore the inscription, 
O oh man, whoever you are, and wherever you come from, for I know you will come. I am Cyrus, who won the Persians their empire. Do not, therefore, begrudge me this bit of earth that covers my bones. So great was the love and admiration commonly attached to Cyrus that, even in the aftermath of the later Persian Wars, the Athenian historian Xenophon would write, he eclipsed all other monarchs, either before him or since. Alexander the Great, though largely defined by his conquest of the Persians, had enormous respect for Cyrus and his accomplishments, and would largely emulate his approach in the forging of his later Hellenistic empire. But back in the here and now of 529 BC, the young Persian empire was facing its first real test. By most tallies, the great king had only been 46 at the time of his death, still in his prime and with decades of rule lying before him. However, with his customary wisdom and foresight, Cyrus had already pondered the question of royal succession, and, before leaving for the east, had made his wishes known. His eldest son, Cambyses II, would be crown prince in Basargidae, while his younger son, Bardaya, would rule over the satrapy of Bactria, modern Afghanistan, and keep watch on the empire's volatile eastern frontier. To forestall any rivals, both boys had been married off to their sisters, Atossa and Roxanne, making for a compact, if incestuous, royal family. It's a measure of the high regard in which his memory was held that no one challenged either Cyrus's plans for succession nor the unseemly marriage of his children. Just as it was a sign of trust between the two royal brothers that Cambyses' first campaign was entirely reliant on Bardia covering his back. This luxury of shared responsibility allowed Cambyses to devote his attention to the project that would define his reign, the conquest of the last great power of the Near East, Egypt. By 529 BC, Amos II had borne witness to Egypt's history as a child, soldier, and pharaoh for over 80 years. He'd been born in the chaos of Neo-Assyria's collapse, only learning later of Necho II's valiant, if futile, defense of Carchemish. In 592 BC, Amos had campaigned in Cush under Samtik II, and driven the Nubian southward to their new capital of Meroe. In 570 BC, as a celebrated general, he'd overthrown Samtik's son Apreus and assumed the mantle of Pharaoh. Three years later, he defended Egypt's frontiers against the powerful Chaldean ruler Nebuchadnezzar II, a victory that had earned him and his kingdom long decades of peace. Amos had wisely spent those years building on the accomplishments of Samtik's line and elevating Egypt to new levels of prosperity. Not coincidentally, the pharaoh's ties to the Greeks were stronger than ever, with Nocritus a major trade hub and powerful Greek advisors a common presence in the royal palace. He'd even performed the novel act of marrying a Greek princess, Laodice, the daughter of King Battus III of nearby Cyrene. When Delphi had burned in 546 BC, Amos had devoted the enormous sum of 1,000 talents to its reconstruction. The only comparable donation had come from the notorious Alcmenid clan of Athens. Amos had also allied himself with another powerful Greek figure, Polycrates, the tyrant of Samos. The year after Cyrus had taken Babylon, Polycrates had seized control of Samos, in collusion with his two brothers, during an all-night festival of the goddess Hera. He then shored up his tyranny by killing one brother, banishing the other, and making alliances with both Amos II of Egypt and his neighboring tyrant, Ligdemus of Naxos. Raising a fleet of a hundred pentaconters and an army of a thousand archers, Polycrates quickly turned to piracy plundering the ships, islands, and coastal territories of the Aegean. The Samians became notorious for intercepting valuable diplomatic gifts sent between the rulers of mainland Greece and Anatolia. 
Such actions made Polycrates many enemies, but also made him widely feared and respected, and, above all, enormously wealthy. At the time, the twelve cities of the Ionian League were still under domination, and supposedly protection, of the Persian satrap of Anatolia, either Harpagus or his successor. Only one coastal city remained quasi-independent. Cyrus had taken note of Miletus's neutrality at the Battle of Thimbra, and instructed Harpagus to grant the city better terms than he offered the other Greeks. Of course, local politics didn't matter much to Polycrates. He was more of a gold-silver slaves type of guy. Bolstered by mercenaries sent from his ally, Ligdemus of Naxos, Samian warships defeated and captured the fleets of both Miletus and Mytilene seizing their cargoes, and enslaving their crews. Despite his career of theft and plunder on the high seas, back home, Polycrates did whatever he could to cultivate a reputation as an enlightened ruler. On Samos, he built both a kilometer-long aqueduct and a magnificent temple to Hera, to which his ally, Amos II, dedicated numerous gifts. He also built an elaborate royal palace, which would be renovated and used some six centuries later by the Roman Emperor Caligula. One Samian native who remained unimpressed was the famous Greek philosopher, mathematician, and mystic Pythagoras. Voting with his feet, Pythagoras left his home city, traveling first to Amos's Egypt before finally settling in Croton one of the largest Greek cities of southern Italy. Once there, he developed his famous theorem concerning the relationship between the sides of right triangles, and pretty much invented the concepts of both geometry and deductive reasoning. In parallel, Pythagoras founded a religious cult whose main beliefs included reincarnation and the sinfulness of eating beans. To him, the linkage between mathematics and religion was obvious. The search for the perfect ideal, of which the physical world was only an imperfect reflection. Back in the imperfect world of 529 BC, Polycrates still reigned over Pythagoras' home and maintained close ties with Amos II of Egypt. Herodotus relates an interesting, but likely fictional, exchange between the two rulers. In the anecdote, Amos chastised Polycrates for being too successful and advised him to throw away whatever he valued most in order to escape a crisis-like reversal of fortune. Polycrates followed the advice and threw a jewel-encrusted ring into the sea. A few days later, a fisherman caught a large fish that he wanted to share with the tyrant. While Polycrates' cooks were preparing the fish, they discovered the ring inside of it. When Polycrates told Amos of his good fortune, the pharaoh immediately broke off their alliance, believing that anyone that lucky was bound to come to a disastrous end. Though their alliance would indeed be broken, and Polycrates would indeed meet a disastrous end, the reason for those developments lie not in a simple reversal of luck, but in the complex political maneuverings of the new Persian king. You may recall from way back that even in the give-and-take era of the Late Bronze Age, the Egyptians had always been extremely reluctant to give up their royal women to be the wives of foreign rulers. Fully aware of this, Cambyses II formally asked Amos II for the hand of one of his daughters in marriage, supposedly to solidify the bonds between their two great kingdoms. Having no desire to surrender his daughter, but also not wanting to refuse the Persian ruler outright, Amos decided to instead send the daughter of the previous pharaoh, a tall and beautiful woman named Nitetis, instructing her to pass herself off as his own daughter. Arriving in Pasargidae, Nitetis immediately divulged both her true origin and Amos' attempted deception. Infuriated at the insult, or so he claimed, Cambyses announced his intention to exact retribution on the faithless Egyptian pharaoh. The next few years were spent preparing, by both sides, for all-out war. 
For Amos, this likely meant leaning even harder on the aid of his foreign allies, recruiting additional Greek mercenaries, requesting the aid of friendly Greek cities, and meeting with Greek advisors who could relate, often firsthand, the Persian tactics used against Ionia. Prominent among the pharaoh's counselors was a Greek tactician and mercenary named Phanes from the Ionian city of Halicarnassus. Well respected by both the Egyptian military and Amos's court, Phanes was exactly the type of man that Amos might pin his hopes on. But strangely and inexplicably, something happened. Herodotus, who relates the tale, had no idea what transpired between the two men but a serious falling out there was. As a result, Phanes left Egypt around 527 BC, making a highly disturbing beeline for the court of Cambyses. Amos, understandably, freaked, and sent his most trusted eunuch to bring Phanes back, dead or alive. After a high-speed boat chase over to Anatolia, the eunuch caught up with his prey in Lycia. But the wily Phanes managed to get him drunk and slip away again, this time making it all the way to Cambyses' staging area of Babylon. The Persian king welcomed him with open arms. He was particularly grateful for his strategic advice to enlist the aid of Arabian kings to ease the Persian army's passage to the Egyptian frontier. For this, and his in-depth knowledge of Amos' war preparations, Phanes was made a general in the Persian army. As if this weren't enough, Polycrates of Samos also decided to go over to the Persians, promising Cambyses a fleet of 40 Greek triremes to use in the conquest of Egypt. In an effort to kill two birds with one stone, Polycrates manned the ships with Samians he considered dangerous to his rule then sent a message to Cambyses that he should kill the men and take the ships upon arrival. This part of the plan backfired. The Samian dissidents put two and two together and turned their triremes back around to attack Polycrates. They managed to defeat the Samian fleet, but were unable to dislodge the tyrant. The rebels then traveled to the Greek mainland and enlisted the aid of both Sparta and Corinth. Eager for spoils and claiming old grievances against Polycrates, the combined forces invaded Samos and laid siege to the capital. After 40 days without success, the siege was called off, and the tenacious Polycrates remained in power. In 526 BC, facing the growing certainty of his country's ruin, Amos II died. After his burial in the royal necropolis at Sais, his son, Samtik III, was proclaimed pharaoh of Egypt. A few days later, rain fell on the city of Thebes. At this point, the ill omen was hardly necessary. The armies of Cambyses were coming, and Egypt was left with only a young and untested pharaoh to meet them. Next episode, the two sides will finally face off at the Battle of Pelusium. We'll observe with some relish the final fate of Polycrates, and we'll also return to Athens to witness the latter years of Pisistratus and watch him pass his tyranny down to another far more problematic generation. All this and more next time on The Ancient World.